health month. So I think we should figure out how to do that officially in the world. Uh, but April here is Integrative Health Month. You're going to hear a lovely um, talk about integrative health in the big picture and complementary therapies. And then on April 24th, um, same room, same time, you're going to hear about how we deliver this um, to our patients, families, students, and providers. So how do we integrate that here at the University of Vermont Medical Center? So we'll be excited to see you back for that one. Um, we do, I'm using this funny microphone, even though I'm pretty sure you all could hear me back there, because we have people live streaming from other parts of our network, and I'd like to welcome them. Uh, if you have a question to ask at the end, someone will bring you a microphone, because we can all hear you, but over the lake they can't, unless you're talking into a microphone. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask you to turn your pagers and cell phones to stun um, so that they don't interrupt the presentation. And um, I'm excited to see everyone here and excited to introduce Kate Fitzpatrick, our CNO, who's going to tell you about our speaker. Thank you so much, Linda, and welcome, everyone. And it's so great to see so many students here. It's wonderful. Welcome. Um, I just wanted to start off and tell you a little bit about um, what the um, Larman Integrative Health Lecture Series and Grand Rounds is all about. So as Linda said, we've kind of made our own endorsement of April as Integrative Health Month. But also, it's a time to highlight there's a lot of important and really exciting work happening around integrative health here. So it's really fitting that we have such a prominent leader in this area to be here with us. And we're really honored to have you with us. So we're very excited. Um, this lecture series is part of the University of Vermont's um, Integrative Healthcare Initiative, which is a joint uh, venture of the University of Vermont Medical Center and several others. So they include the University of Vermont College of Nursing and Health Sciences and the College of Medicine and the Laura Mann Center. The initiative's goal is to provide a holistic approach to health and wellness for optimal patient experience and for quality of life. So some bold goals, but some really important things. The UVM Integrative Health Initiative will include uh, proven and safe, effective clinical therapeutic offerings to complement our traditional therapies that we offer in medicine. It's also uh, a, a structure that we hope will promote into investigative research of the qualitative and quantitative impacts of integrative health approaches on patient, um, and I will say health, of um, both patients and families and our staff well-being. Um, it's an interdisciplinary integrative health um, certificate program that's available to both undergraduate and graduate students. So if there's anybody in the audience who has some of that interest, this is a great time to learn more about it. Um, and with that, I'm going to begin the introduction of our speaker, um, Lori Knutson, who um, is a clinician and healthcare administrator with over 25 years dedicated to the advancement of integrative healthcare. I had the chance to meet Lori earlier today, and I was just so impressed with what she, as one nurse, has been able to influence in the organizations that she's been. So the power of one nurse's passion is just so impressive, and she's really operationalized and helps people understand what integrative health can bring to the bedside and to patient care. She is currently the Corporate Administrative Director of Integrative Health and Medicine for Meridian Health in New Jersey. In 2014, excuse me, Lori established an integrative health clinic for underserved populations in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and was the clinical lead for an interprofessional HRSA grant with the University of Minnesota School of Nursing. She is the founding executive director for the Penny George Institute for Healing, um, for, excuse me, for Health and Healing at Alina Health in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the largest and most comprehensive integrative health program in the U.S. So pretty impressive. Lori was instrumental in the infrastructure database development that led to a $2.5 million National Institutes of Health grant to study integrative pain management in the acute care setting. She's on faculty at the Leadership Program in Integrative Healthcare at Duke University. She's an advisor to the Academic Consortium of Complementary and Alternative Healthcare, an editorial board member of the Global Advances in Health, Health in Medicine. Lori is the founder of the Transformative Nurse Training Program, which is a program I was so excited to hear about, and it gave me, Patty, others in the room, lots of ideas about what we could think about here. But this is an integrative nursing curriculum that has trained thousands of nurses, including those within the California Veter Veterans Administration and the Mayo Clinic. In 2006, the American Holistic Nurses Association honored Lori as a Holistic Nurse of the Year. So she's an amazing person to have with us. We're so delighted that you took the time to come and speak with us. So with that, I'd like to welcome you, Lori. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. 
So although I have 26 years of experience, I'm only 28. <laughs> That's what integrative health does for you. So. And the green section are students? Cool. That's always a good thing to see. So I'm just curious how many um, doctors are in the room? Yay. And nurses? And how about physical therapists, uh, radiation therapy folks, um, and others? What are others? Chaplain. Yay. All right. So it's an interprofessional group of people, which I have to tell you, even five years ago when I would give a talk, it was usually mostly nurses and doctors and mostly nurses. So to see this is already, I would say you're already on a really good, strong foundation. Plus, I have to tell you, as I've been visiting with um, Kara and with Patty, I don't think you realize how much you already have here. I mean, besides the inspiration and just this commitment, there's already a lot of stuff going on. And as we talked earlier, we're, uh, you know, sort of defining what the it is, what is integrative health and what is integrative medicine for this institution is probably one of the greatest challenges. And then even the greater challenge is the implementation part, which takes a lot and a lot based on relationships. So I have a lot of information. We're going to kind of skim the top of many things, but what I'm trying to do is set the stage for why right now this is so important in healthcare, in community, employer-based um, uh, wellness programs, um, that integrative health and medicine is really a catalyst to what is changing the culture of health and well-being in our society. So we're going to skim through a lot of things. I think I have a little less than an hour, and you want to leave a little time for Q&A. So I'm going to just clip, all right? Um, and my, but my clicker is not clicking. Oh, there we go. Okay, let me back up. So I think it's um, very important to actually start out with some definitions. Because the language of integrative health and medicine has changed so much. So we've heard CAM, complementary alternative medicine, there's integrative medicine, there's integrative health, um, and all these things get sort of confusing. So think of integrative health as a large umbrella. And under that umbrella, there is a philosophy of holism, holistic health. The idea that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. It's about presence. It's about beliefs and attitudes and values. And then there's integrative medicine, which is actually now a subspecialty. So physicians can get boarded in integrative medicine. And then functional medicine, which is sort of rising up right now. And functional medicine is a whole new training for physicians and now nurse practitioners. Um, and it is based on root cause analysis. So it looks at really the biochemistry of things like chronic disease and, and many other things. And then we bring in traditional healing. So we really honor all healing systems. And in some cases, we bring in some of the um, interventions that these healing systems have, like acupuncture out of oriental medicine. Then there are complementary therapies. So think of things like aromatherapy, guided imagery, biofeedback. There's the whole realm of nutraceuticals and supplements and herbal products. And then the full integration of all of this with allopathic Western conventional medicine. So that's really the umbrella. And I think sometimes just helping people understand the language and what it's compo the composite of um, integrative health is really important. And foundationally, knowing all of those things, foundationally, this is what we really strive for. This is what we look at. And it's first and foremost, our intention in integrative health is to empower individuals in their own self-care. That really is what we're about. We want people to have the knowledge, skills, resources, and tools so that they can um, act on their own primary care. We believe that self-care is the true primary care. So that's the first and foremost. Nutrition, looking at food as medicine, that food is not just about something that takes care of hunger, but that we actually can reverse chronic disease through, through food. That physical activity is important. That sleep underlying is foundational to integrative health and healing. The sense of mind and body connection, how our thoughts directly impact the biochemistry and physiology of our body. The sense of purpose and meaning, which quite frankly, and I'm glad to see that um, there's chaplain representation here, but that sense of um, what gives my life meaning, what makes me get up in the morning, um, my relationships. So all of these things are the foundations of integrative health. Does that kind of help set stage between definitions of language and then just understanding that integrative health is not acupuncture. 
Integrative health as a whole is not massage therapy. Those are elements of, but it's much bigger. It really is a whole um, way of thinking and a, and a paradigm shift. So why is it so important right now? So I'm gonna run through some things that may be already familiar to you, but I think when we put it all together, it paints a picture of why it is so important that we focus on integrative health right now. So this came out um, from the federal government. It's titled, Your New Healthcare System. <laughs> It's meant for the layperson to um, travel the map and figure out how you get good health care. Now, I think it's really interesting. Can you tell me where the patient is? So the patient's way, way down in the corner, way down there. But in some way, shape, or form, we're supposed to figure out how we get good care. And I don't know about you, but this stresses me out. Um, it's really difficult for us to figure it out. And it also answers to why things are so expensive and why things are so siloed. Because it's about things and squares connected by lines. And I typically say when I go into an organization, what I look at is the white space behind because that's all our opportunity. That's where we get to be innovative and creative. It is not the lines, dots, squares, and triangles. So just to run through some numbers, um, obesity, as you can see, from 90 to 2000 to 2010, 10 years apart, how it's gotten really out of hand, and just in the last four years, it's actually doubled. Same with diabetes, same with hypertension. And then we look at the decrease in inactivity. So as disease, chronic diseases go up, things around lifestyle management, our activity levels are going down, and there's a definite correlation between those. Then we have this epidemic of depression. Um, this is actually sort of old because Rand did the study back in 2004, but when we think about 2020 as being what the World Health Organization says, the tipping point of um, depression becoming the second leading cause of health impairment worldwide, we're only five, four years away from that. And I would say to you that depression is one of those components of purpose and meaning in life. So what does that mean? People are really struggling with their sense of purpose and meaning. And depression is linked to physical activity and lifestyle decisions and obesity. And so all of these are correlated. And then, of course, we have this huge epidemic of opioid analgesics, that that rise is just going up and up and up. And I know that your state has um, some activity around that. But in and of itself, we've, as a medical establishment, have contributed in a great deal to this because our tool bag in medicine has been relatively small to deal with chronic pain conditions. And what do we do? We give them medications and people become addicted and they become addicted to more than one. Um, in my previous clinical life, I worked as a chronic pain nurse. And I have to tell you the devastation of what I saw in what I called cocktails of medications that still were not helping the person with their pain because the pain is much more than just physical. It's emotional, it's psychological, and it's spiritual. But we don't address all of those elements when we think about pain. Um, just some statistics about where we're going and the CDC's new guidelines for prescribing opioids. So now physicians have guidelines on how to do this. And, when, and what I want to say is that it, this is as difficult for practitioners, physicians, and nurses as it is for the patients that they serve. Physicians and nurses do not want to create this. It's just we don't have enough tools in our toolbox to answer the whole person. And so we end up in this, in this sort of crisis state. But the beautiful part of this is it's an opportunity for integrative care because the CDC is saying there are non-opioid treatments to chronic pain and we need to look at those and we need to pay for those and we need to integrate those. So you add all of that, chronic disease, chronic pain, um, our lack of multiple tools in the toolbox, then you add in the systems requirements that the feds are looking at. We need to have high HCAP scores in order to get our payments. Um, you know, most of these, as you can see, are not quantitative measures, right? They're qualitative. They're about relationships and communication and physical environment, pain control. This isn't necessarily quantitative science. This is about creating a human experience. And so if we can get paid on creating a human experience, I will tell you integrative health has such a role in that, in that patient experience. And then you all know the 33 measures that that are required to meet in order for payment or some payment. So all of these pressures between the people that we don't have the tools to care for, the chronic disease that's happening, 
the lack of knowledge and skills on the individual to be empowered in their own health care, the federal standards and regulations, and it becomes this place where we really feel like we're in crisis. And it's hitting us as providers. We're responding to this in negative ways. So when we look at, this was a study that was done in um, 2012 and published in the Archives of Internal Medicine, that the physician burnout is skyrocketing. And I will also tell you that the physician and nursing suicide rates are skyrocketing. And medical student suicide rates are skyrocketing. Something isn't working very well, and we have to find an answer to it. And I thought this was kind of funny, because <laughs> it's true. Sometimes it feels like 24 hours a day I am stressed out by all these things around us. And I also think sometimes we don't realize the impact of all the things that I just spoke about, but every single day in healthcare, each one of us is impacted by all of those things. So we really are at the perfect storm. And sometimes I say that the best opportunities come at the time when we have the most pain, because that's when we have the motivation to make a change. And I think when we talk about the healthcare reform, that was sort of initiation to say we need to do something in healthcare, although I would say it was more about payment reform than actual health care reform, but we're moving in that direction. So this is why the stage is set for integrative health care. And I couldn't be more proud to be in this time frame and more proud to be with organizations like you all who are taking the courageous step forward to make this happen. I love this quote by Buckminster Fuller. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. You change something to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And I think that's sort of what hap what's happening. It is an organic shift that we can no longer practice the way that we have been practicing medicine or health and health care. We have to see a fundamental shift, not only in the payment systems, but in the way that we come to our work and the way that we perform our work. So we need a new model, and we're emerging in this new model. And what I would tell you is, in general, as a nurse, as a healthcare professional, and all of you, we typically see somebody in illness and disease, right? We don't see them when they're healthy. We see people when they're sick. And our goal is really to get them back to their neutral point. But in integrative healthcare, we want to get far upstream. We want to get past that place of neutral, and we want to optimize people's health and well-being. And again, remember, we want to empower them so that when they travel down this paradigm, because we all will, we all will end at the tip over here on the red side at some point in time in our lives. But the journey can be one that has some sense of quality and some sense of respect. And that's what integrative health care can do. If we can get farther upstream and empower people, we will have a journey that provides some dignity and some sense of quality of life. So that brings me to, in this new model and, and with um, health reform, we're really looking at populations of health. So if we go back to obesity, diabetes, hypertension, we're looking at populations of people that we can make dramatic changes with. Um, I opened up a center for the underserved, uh, integrative mental health center for the underserved in Minneapolis, focusing on very diverse populations of cultures and trying to focus not only on the individual, but really taking groups of people into um, group sessions, so healthcare sessions, physician sessions, acupuncture sessions, and doing this in a, in a group community provision to say that when we are in relationship with each other in community, we have so much more strength to change our lifestyle decisions and behaviors because it becomes a community initiative. It's not a solo person dealing with a solo disease or an illness. So being upstream, those upstream factors are so important. The social determinants of health as we're hearing more and more. It used to be we only looked at health or health care on that medical side and all this other stuff we never talked about. But now we know that all of this are the dynamics that lead to medical care. So the farther upstream we can get, the better it will be. So I also think we have an opportunity in the way payment is shifting to. So we've always historically been a fee-for-service. You get paid for the procedures and the treatments and the people that you see. So the more of that you do, the more you get paid. It really hasn't been based on quality or value. And now payment and bundled services and value-based purchasing is all about looking at quality of care and created the ultimate experience for an individual in their health and well-being. 
And you see this gap, and that's the question. How do we get from the fee-for-service to the value-based? And I really believe integrative health is the catalyst in that gap. And we have such opportunity to help reach that value-based um, uh, second curve. So instead of that first picture of the health system that I showed you, where it's pretty chaotic, this is what we're really looking at. We're looking at things that intersect with each other. We're looking at ways that we can, again, empower communities to own the health and well-being of those within their communities and to partner with our medical schools and with our clinics so that we are seeking out guides who are experts but not those that have to think that they have to fix our problem. We want to know how to sort of take care of ourselves, and then when we need that help, that expert help, we actually have a partner on the path for that, and it takes the burden off the physicians, it takes the burden off the healthcare system, and it really places responsibility on us as individuals, but we can only do that if we actually have the knowledge and the skills to do that. And if we start to focus on communities empowering us with that, um, we will go much farther. I want to mention just three things that, um, that from a national perspective are investing in our ability to actually be this healthy catalyst. So one is um, when we again talk about the pain issues, um, the feds put $21.7 million into the investigation of non-drug approaches to pain, PTSD, substance use, and sleep disorders. And a lot of this came out of the pressure from the VA and the DOD um, because of the high rates of PTSD and subsequent um, substance abuse that came out of that. So to look at non-drug-related ways to, um, to help support these conditions. And then, and I believe you all are involved in this piece, the Center for Integrative Medicine and Primary Care, which is an um, initiative to really take in interprofessional care at the, um, the physician level and integrative care within that. So integrating interprofessional care and integrative care within primary care. Um, so this 1.7 million actually isn't a whole lot of money when you think of what how money comes through the federal government. But it was a, enough of a commitment to say that something has to happen in primary care that supports the providers as well as supporting the patients who deserve something of greater value. And then finally, just last January, a year ago, Joint Commission came out with the standards around pain management to include non-drug-related um, interventions. And they list acupuncture, massage therapy, relaxation, cognitive therapy, and a few others. So there are statements being made from our government agencies to say we've got to do something different. And now the push will be, how is it getting paid for? Because not all of this is being paid for. And then there's this, um, and Janet Kahn, who many of you probably know, Janet has had a big role in policy at, um, in Washington around integrative health care. And you may not know this, but Janet is the leader in policy and in integrative health care in the country. And it, yes. She is. And she's right here. She's like yours. I would use that and abuse it when you need to. Um, so this, this statement about that states need to see all providers who are licensed and credentialed as equals and insurers need to acknowledge that. So it's important that each state understand who is licensed in their state. Um, so for instance, Acupuncture is licensed in most states now, so most insurers will cover acupuncture to some level. We all know there are multiple policies that are out there and everybody pays differently, um, but most states and most insurers now cover acupuncture specifically for chronic pain conditions. So this is also an important national statement to say we will not deny licensed providers in your state from being insured or having insurance coverage. Um, I wanted to mention just this article that um, I published with a couple of friends of mine not too long ago. We wanted to look at the, um, the National Health Survey that comes out every few years. Um, there's a, a component that is the um, alternative, alternative health supplement, and it looks at the utilization of CAM, complementary and alternative medicine, by consumers. But there is a component that we looked at. We wanted to see what health care providers were doing, their utilization of CAM. So we actually studied the data, and what we found was that personal CAM use by healthcare workers um, is 
greater than the general public. But it's quiet. People aren't talking about it. So as physicians, nurses, other healthcare providers, we're actually seeking out some of these complementary approaches for our own self-care, but we don't want to talk about it to our patients. And what would happen if we actually were vulnerable enough to discuss our own personal utilization and satisfaction in using these kind of therapies to our patients? It would open them up to telling the truth to us about what they're using. And so I would encourage all of us to start having that conversation. If we're utilizing it in our own care, shouldn't we be vulnerable enough with our patients to tell them that so that they can feel comfortable in, in um, informing us about their utilization? So um, I want to just talk a little bit about pain because pain is a huge component for healthcare systems. Again, it's a huge component from a community perspective as we were talking about opioid utilization or overutilization. So at Alina, where I was previously, um, we did an inpatient study and looked at pain management. And we had very large populations of people to study, which was great. And we actually went through our service lines. And although you see the pre-scores are pretty low, remember, we didn't change their current um, care, care that they were receiving. So they were probably already receiving pain drugs. What we wanted to show was the influence of complementary therapies in addition to normal care. And so as we were able to show in all the different patient populations, so it didn't matter if you had a heart condition or if you had a neurologic condition or if you were delivering, the therapies that we were brought forward to manage pain were effective across patient populations. Um, and then we also did that for anxiety because what we realize is anxiety sometimes is a precursor to pain. People think of anxiety and they interpret it as pain because they don't know what else to do about it and because they can ask for a pain medication to reduce their anxiety. So we, we misinterpret anxiety as pain and then we cause a whole other sequela of events with side effects. So we saw that we affected both anxiety and pain. That led to our research study that we did overall that led to our two and a half million dollar NIH grant. Um, so what we know and, and what we've been talking about is when you want to focus on something that's going to have high impact both in patient care, patient experience, provider provision of services, and have an economic value to the health system, pain is something that affects all populations. And so it's one area that I often tell people when they're building programs, focus on pain, because that's where you get your biggest bang for your buck. Um, so the National Center for Integrated Primary Health Care, I talked a little bit about that. You guys are already involved in that. I hear you have maybe the largest coalition of participants, which is really cool. Um, and this is an important thing because it's really looking at the education value um, for primary care providers. Um, so, and it is interprofessional because it's coming out of a HRSA grant. And um, this right now is on trial. I can't remember, it's uh, five, three years or five years of curriculum development. The intention is that it's for um, students who will be coming out of school. And my hope is when we talk interprofessional that it's not just for medical students, but that it will be for all students. And I hope it's also for those that are already out practicing because people need this kind of education. Then we have the Academic Consortium um, for Integrative Medicine and Health, and everybody now is changing their name. Everything is now going to Integrative Health and Integrative Medicine versus Complementary and Alternative. Um, so the language is evolving as the practice is evolving. Uh, the Academic Consortium is a very large consortium of academic health centers across the country. I think the number is something like 65 now. Um, and I don't know if Vermont is a part of that. Yeah, so see, you're already in. You're already in the club. Um, the value of being part of this consortium is there's significant, significant amount of partnership and research to continue to validate and show the evidence around integrative health care. So I would encourage you all to find out how, now that you, we all know that you're a partner in this, how you can utilize those, that resource um, because it's a very good one. And then there's the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine. Um, so this is an independent group. Um, very, uh, in fact, they just transi transitioned over the last couple of years because there was the American Holistic Medical Association that now merged with this group and they've become one. Um, they have a lot of offerings, a lot of trainings, 
They have an annual conference. So again, it's just a platform for learning and education as you're moving forward. And, and truly, I would go online and look at some of their free offerings because they, their intent is to bring this out to the community. And then there's the Academic Collaborative of Integrative Health, which started really as all the sort of CAM schools, so Bastyr and locally in Minneapolis, it was our Northwestern Health Sciences University. There are, I don't know how many now, 20, 25 of these academic health um, institutions. They gather together to create some standardization around their own training, and now they are integrating with the other academic group consortium so that it really becomes interprofessional education and training. So even the world of um, integrative medicine is moving from its own silos because we had integrative medicine on the conventional side and we had all of the CAM providers not necessarily always integrating, and now there's that push to all be one. So there's a lot going on. Again, I'm just setting the stage for you to understand why now is just so pertinent for us to be acting on this. And then I spoke to a little bit about the Integrative Health um, Policy Consortium. Um, one of the things that they are working on is this piece about Cover My Care. So they're trying to help states and health insurers begin to cover care for services. And the other thing that they are working on is actually partnering with um, employers to help educate employers about their power in getting their insurers to cover this as a benefit set for their employees. So we, when you go out into the employer world, and right now I'm working with three large corporations in um, New Jersey who are beginning this process of, of uh, creating their employee wellness as integrative. And I don't just mean employee wellness programs, I mean their healthcare benefit set. So this kind of work nationally is so important to move this work forward, again, upstream with employers and with communities before it even gets downstream into medical care. Healthways is on that bandwagon. Healthways is an international company. Do people know Healthways? So it's a for-profit company, but they're really focused on bringing, again, a more integrative approach to employee health and wellness. And they're doing several different things. They actually have a database of um, CAM practitioners, if you will, that they have vetted based on certain credentialing um, and other um, regulatory requirements. And so employers can access this database wherever they happen to be so that employers don't have to vet these people themselves. So this um, organization is doing that amongst many other things. Um, Iora Health, has anybody here heard of Iora Health? I would encourage you to find, about, uh, find out about Iora Health. So Iora is a for-profit company, and I say that only because healthcare in general is not for profit. Right? Iora Health is a primary care group. Um, it's actually a business, um, came out of some um, MBAs from Harvard who said they saw this whole environment of what was happening in healthcare. They also saw what was going on in the integrative world. And they said, you know what? Let's not wait for government. Let's not wait for medicine. Let's create our own integrated primary care. And that's what they're doing. And they're actually going to some really unique groups to set up primary care clinics. So for instance, um, in New England, they're working with the Carpenters Benefit Fund, so they're going to unions. Um, the one on the very bottom, the Grameen Group, is actually non-documented immigrants in Queens. Um, and basically what they do is they have a formula, um, and it's actually a, pro a positive profit margin. But they were bringing in integrative care based on that population of people, so it's designed in partnership with the people that they're going to serve. And, um, and it almost is like a healthcare co-op. So the people are so invested in their primary care clinic that they feel a sense of ownership. And in fact, in the Grameen um, Clinic, the people who come for services are also the housekeepers of the clinic. So it's, it's thinking about how do you create healthcare in a community for the people that you serve, and you bring in their healing traditions and other integrative approaches. And believe it or not, and this is membership-based, so the business model is different. So the Green Group I know the best. Each person pays $10 a week, and everything is covered. So all their health care is covered, all their education is covered, group things are covered, but they are required to participate in health promotion 
group offerings. That's part of the sort of coming into this primary care clinic. So it's a very different model and it's moving very quickly across the country. So then we get into sort of the, the measurement. So how do we actually measure this new form of, of healthcare delivery, this integrative health? And, and quite frankly, I will tell you, I think even that language is gonna change. I really believe it's just gonna be healthcare and it's just gonna be medicine and we're not gonna have to say integrative anymore because it just will be the tapestry of what we do. So Optum um, has created their Resource Center for Health and Wellbeing and it helps employers to look at what are the successful metrics. So the clinical metrics, meaning how are we keeping your people healthy, how are we reducing chronic disease, how are we, we reducing work injury, um, some of the workers' comp claims that come in, um, how are we actually looking at the better metrics around health and well-being? And so they've been doing a lot of um, value-based um, metric design, and you can actually get some of these white papers for free, and I would encourage people who are interested in understanding the economics and the clinical measurement tools to take a look at this, because I think their formula is something that can be applied to health systems. And then Healthways and Gallup partner together to create this well-being index, and I don't know if people have seen this or not, but every single state, including yours, um, has a well-being index. And the national gov government is actually looking at these state indexes to say, okay, where are the healthy states and what are they doing and where are the states that are not so healthy? This is actually used, being used by the World Economic Forum. So all the big international companies that are out there are using this for their um, employee indexes. So it's another tool of measurement. And what they measure is not just physical health. They're not just doing the biometrics of health. What they're well-being to them are these things, purpose, social, financial, community, and physical. And I think we have to start thinking again when I showed you this um, social determinants of health, that's what these are. So people are thinking very upstream about what do we mean by health and well-being instead of just measuring disease and illness. And I think that's where we need to go. Um, so this actually came out just this spring. This is the World Economic Forum's um, publication, which is free online, and they use the well-being index, and their whole focus is how to realize returns on health, and they're measuring by using maximizing healthy life years. So they really want to see their employees live healthy years because for them, as for-profit international companies, they need healthy, productive people to keep their gross margin, right? So they're investing in people in different ways and they're measuring by this maximizing healthy life years. So I, I'm showing you these metric tools because we have to think about how we measure health and well-being differently than we've always measured it. Um, there's also a social formula and I actually use this at the clinic, the underserved clinic that I worked at to do partnerships and getting grants. And so there's a whole social return on investment so when we start looking at things like opioid addiction, which isn't happening in the hospitals, that addiction issue is out in the communities. We're realizing it, in some cases we cause it, but we aren't living it, the communities are. And so how do we look at a social return on investment, which means decreasing the utilization of healthcare for inappropriate use? How do we show that um, people are getting food access in the way that they need to? So poverty, food scarcity, there's a whole social impact that goes into creating healthy lives. So this formula we actually use to show that when you give people the knowledge, skills, tools, and resources for self-care, then you support them on their journey through health coaching, that they actually transform their lives and they reduce the utilization of health care and they become employed and they get housing and they become contributing to society instead of pulling from society. So finally, I want to just talk a, briefly about, is that clock right? Is that the real time? I'm just watching the clock and it's like, yes? Oh, good, I'm good. I'm whipping. Um, so how many people here uh, know about the Genome Project that went on for a period of time? And epigenetics, the new science of epigenetics, which isn't all that new, but it's now sort of getting out to the masses. Um, and you always know it's getting out to the masses when Time Magazine has it on their front cover, right? Um, so this idea that our genes are turned on and off by things outside of our genes. 
So we have these little switches within our genetic codes, and we used to think, just like we used to think that our nervous system and our brain was static, we now know neuroplasticity tells us that that is not true. Well, that's true with our genes and our DNA. So we now know that the things that influence our genes, our genetic makeup, are lifestyle, which means we have a certain responsibility about the chronic diseases that we're seeing. And the other thing is, we can actually reverse chronic disease by changing our lifestyle. This is like a big wow. It's huge. Um, so just as I, I spoke about, the things that, that turn on the genes um, and turn them off are based on the things that we eat. So as I talked about, food is medicine. And we also can think about exercise as medicine. And, I mean, and truly as medicine, because it will change your genetic, genetic coding. It's not just a, a trend. Um, there's an actual application to our physiology. Um, and there's, so I talked briefly about um, functional medicine, which is another emerging medicine that is coming under this umbrella of integrative health and medicine. Functional medicine really looks at root cause analysis. So it's getting down to that genetic coding and looking at lifestyles. And they do a very comprehensive lifestyle intake along with biolog biologics and some genetic testing. And through that, they develop an individualized, personalized plan of care that is more about a journey than a one-time visit. Um, so this is sort of the emerging um, things that are coming forward in training. Um, I'm going to skip over that one. So the last place I want to take you to is sort of the new things that are happening um, in the way of healthcare and integrative care. Everybody knows Uber. So Uber is now moving into the healthcare world, and it's moving into the integrative healthcare world. And in New York, there's a company called Zeal, and they are Uber Massage. And there's another company called Uber Acupuncture. So on your phone, when you need a treatment, you just dial up, and your person shows up wherever you are. This is the way consumer-driven healthcare happens. You know, you find a technology, you find a model that is more um, service-based, you apply it to healthcare, and pretty soon people are designing their own primary care, right? Which is exactly what we want them to do. Remember, our own healthcare is our own primary care. We will seek out medical care when we need it, but hopefully most of what we do is through our own access of resources and knowledge. So people are getting really smart. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was at a technology conference, a healthcare technology conference, and I was absolutely amazed by some of the things that I was seeing. And so um, the little piece up on the top, which you just put on different points on your body, measures everything from EKGs or EEGs um, to your emotional stress, your blood pressure, your heart rate. Um, it's sort of a, a vital sign um, composite that you download into your um, iPhone, and it comes up with sort of a, um, a diagnosis, if you will, and a treatment plan for you. Should you call a doctor right away, or should you learn mindfulness? Should you just take a breath? Should you eat something? So it'll actually create automatically, based on your, these scores, um, what kind of plan you should have. The, little, the one on, the, um, on your right is eye exam. So this little piece just fits on your iPhone, you put it up to your eye, and it will do a vision exam. Downloads, tells you what's going on, tells you should you call a provider or should you do some other care and treatment. Um, same with the one on this end, a stethoscope that does a multitude of other um, diagnosis pieces. And then these meditation devices that are coming out, the Muse, which is on the bottom, and Think, T-H-Y-N which actually looks at your um, beta, alpha, theta waves and helps for people who can't seem to settle their mind down because they're thinking all the time. It actually helps to get you into the brain waves that allow you to meditate and calm your mind. So people are, I mean, technology is really blowing me away. In fact, I'll tell you one other one. Is there, are there any acupuncturists in the room? So there's one, and maybe you've seen this, but similar to that little round device that I was showing up there, there is um, a PhD acupuncturist 
um, working out of a little science room at Harvard who has designed um, a device that actually diagnoses tongue, pulse, takes in all of that. Um, you put it into your, you hook it up to your iPhone. It comes up with what your diagnosis is and where you have stagnation or whatever it might be in your meridian system. Then it shows you the acupuncture points that you need to address and you flip the thing over and it has a little acupuncture device that you self acupuncture. I know, crazy? I know. So, um, so I think instead of the perfect storm, I think we have a blue ocean. We have such a huge opportunity to be part of this amazing change that's coming forward. And the beauty is you guys are all on the front end of this and you have amazing support and you have Kara who's really working hard to um, try to implement and organize and operationalize some things. And what I would say to you is don't fear the future, jump in because even though you're here as healthcare providers, you're also people who need healthcare. And it's as much the time for people in the community as it is for us. And I just think it's so exciting and we have such an opportunity. So for me, it really is now. This is the time. All right, that's all I have. And I think we have about 12 minutes for some questions, if people have any questions. And there's somebody a question has a... After, which we can take more okay. After. And there's a mic. If anybody has... It doesn't have to be a question. It could be a comment. It's a thought. Contact person. Contact person. Contact oh, person? You should stand up so people know what you look like. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Get the man with the stethoscope. So I was really intrigued by, well, first I enjoyed your, your talk very much, but I was very intrigued by um, many of the apps for the iPhone and so on. What's a good way to stay up to date with what's available? So, um, so you know what I will do? I don't, do you have a way to send information out to people? So there are a couple of technology links um, from this conference that I was at that I'd be happy to send to Kara and she can get it out to you. Because the technology, I gotta tell you, it's moving so quickly, it's almost hard to stay up on, but consumers somehow are accessing it more quickly than healthcare providers are. Maybe we're in denial, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Probably is the right thing to look at. Um, I have sciatica, arthritis on my right side, and I get leg cramps. And um, so I'm looking on the internet and trying to find my way to, because I know that the normal healthcare system doesn't work for me. Mm. Uh, I had an injection for my sciatica, it didn't work. Um, I had x-rays for my arthritis, and the doctor told me, well, you have arthritis, and your uh, cartilage is gone. So you might get, uh, I don't know. <laughs> so it provided no guidance yeah. for me. So I'm looking on the internet. Yeah. So um, the question is, how do I find my way to uh, something that's going to allow me to do more hiking and yeah. lead a healthier life. You are the perfect example of why integrative health care is so important. And you're on that bell curve of somebody who is actually an explorer. You're seeking it out, you're looking for it, and you're willing to ask some different questions. Um, and I happen to know there are some integrative physicians here, and I don't know if, I don't know how you can get to certain people. Like, could this gentleman somehow get to you? Okay, so, so we have two integrative medicine physicians here, and one we'll talk to afterwards. Okay. But it is, it is difficult unless consumers know how to access in their own facility or in their own communities. Um, and 
That's why Healthways has developed this opportunity, and that's for consumers too, to actually go online and see who's available that has been, and when I say vetted, that they've been looked at for their credentials and their level of expertise. Um, but it is, it is difficult, Kara. Sometimes it's hard to know who to go to. Your primary care provider might be a good start to help. Oh, sorry. I said we have a website, um, lauramancenter.org, which is a network of integrative providers. So you can go online and find a local provider. So I, d I just want to say, ideally, um, individuals like you, which are probably the majority of people now that are have some they're suffering with something like an arthritis or, or whatever um, that ideally your primary care clinic would be a place for you to gather those resources and that's why the training the grant that is helping with integrated primary care centers is so important you are that person who needs that kind of integrative approach and and hopefully in the very near future, primary care clinics will include integrative care as part of that. Yeah. Uh, hi, Lori. I know you. I'm hi. a physician at Northwestern Medical Center, not too far from here. Where do you put lifestyle medicine into all this? Where do I put what? Lifestyle medicine. Lifestyle? Lifestyle. It is. This is all lifestyle. That's why the whole epigenetics piece. But, but and, and you know this. Physicians are not trained in lifestyle medicine, right? You are. Exception. You are. But in general, that's not what physicians are trained in. They're trained in disease and illness, right? And it's more of a fix-it model than a health promotion model. But it's all about lifestyle. And that's why right now our focus in some ways has to be so much on the consumer, again, empowering them with the knowledge and skills, like this gentleman who's exploring that himself. We're, we're, in, we're in this transition place where we don't have the systems in place yet, but we have this epidemic of people who really need it. But lifestyle is the core. Yeah, Janet. Yep. So two things. I want to make one comment on what you're just saying, which is I just got an email today from Dean Ornish saying over the weekend at the, there was a, the annual scientific meeting of the American College of Cardiology, a thousand cardiologists got six hours of lifestyle medicine download. <laughs> so it's happening, it's starting, but that's the thing. It's going to be specialty by specialty to get it into the... Or the academic thing. institutions making that part of their curriculum. Yeah, exactly. So here's my question. It's a, it's a different thing. It has to do with... Uh, so thank you for the plug for IHPC and the Cover My Care. <laughs> effort, yeah. which is important because yeah. that is what is going to take it out of coming into medical centers like this but asking patients to pay for it out of pocket. The issue really is coverage. Mm -hmm. What else do you see on the horizon that's hopeful besides 2706, which we're all working on? You mean from coverage perspective? Yeah. How do we get it to people who, uh, you know, what is happening at CMS? How do we get it to people mm -hmm. in Medicare, Medicaid, people who so the way that I think it's gonna, we're going to see it is in the value-based purchasing where we have bundled services. And so the integrative components, and, and I'm not just talking about the interventions of massage or acupuncture, but really lifestyle, lifestyle medicine. When that can be bundled into these value-based purchasing components, that's when payment is going to happen. But I also say that I think the Iora Health model is an interesting model. A $10 a month and I get integrative primary care. And so I don't think there's going to be a one way. I hope there's not a one way because we're all so different. But I, I do think from a federal government payment perspective that the value-based purchasing and bundled services is where we can integrate integrative care. And that's, and we're, I'm working on that right now with these employers, so that's the other direction, is that we don't wait for government, but we go to employers and we empower them with the knowledge of how they negotiate their health care benefit sets to include these things. Yeah. A couple of thoughts based on what you said. Um, I, I, pre I appreciate your bringing technology into the discussion. Um, I've often thought that um, speaking broadly, you know, medicine has had this pendulum of high tech, low touch, mm -hmm. which has been a problem. Mm -hmm. And um, integrative therapies are often high touch, low tech. Yeah. In other words, an acupuncture needle or a massage person's hands are pretty low tech, um, but they're very high touch. 
Um, and I think also Western medicine has excelled with the objective uh, data that's provided and um, integrative care is often excels in the subjective part of medicine, but both are really important. And my dream has always been, you know, inter true integration sort of brings the best, best of both together right. so that when we add technology to these high touch therapies, mm -hmm. um, it shouldn't take the touch away. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes so, total sense. Yeah. And I think that that's part of the issue. Even, do you all remember when you went live on Epic? And there was this feeling of you're spending way too much time in front of the computer and you, you're losing the relationship, that humanistic touch point with people because we get so based in technology. And I think that that's always a balance. And, and I think as providers in the integrative world bring in more technology, that's something that they're going to have to be aware of too. We get so dependent on that and we move away from the relationship. And it's not just the touch, it's just that human sense of presence with another human being, which is part of the therapeutic healing process. There's one in the back. Yes, yeah, so I'm just wondering if you have any um, tips for acupuncturists. If you're saying that physicians aren't trained in this, and as acupuncturists we are saying we are trained in lifestyle changes, that's one of our hallmarks, how do we facilitate that uh, communication happening, you know, as I hear the curriculum is being developed, I'm wondering where we are. We are frequently not included in any form of the advisory boards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm wondering if you have some, something hopeful or something to help guide us in how to make that happen or so, how to help uh, it happen. So the group that's meeting, the, the Center for Integrated Primary Care, that is a huge interdisciplinary um, group. So it does include acupuncturists, massage therapists, naturopaths, as well as physicians and nurses and radiologists. And so it's a very interdisciplinary team on a national level to start to create that integrated um, and integrative curriculum. But I think locally, I mean, you have this opportunity, and Kara's just going to have to like wear a sandwich board and get out and let everybody know that she's a touch point to help create those relationships and build those bridges. Um, I don't know locally how, what all is going on, although I do know Janet showed me this building where a bunch of people are practicing acupuncture, massage, and a bunch of other things, and I'm like, get a bus and bring your docs over there and let them see, let them experience what that is. And when you have to see a doctor, a medical doctor as an acupuncturist, Help them understand what you do in your practice. You know, I think it's so much about stepping out of who we are and being in relationship. But there are things happening nationally and locally. You have this going on, and it's super powerful to build those bridges. It's not. It's oftentimes we think about um, how we're not being included, and I would say, how do we step up? You know, like we all have to step up to be a part of it and figure it out. And you just did. Yes, I've met with Kara. However, however, you know, I, saw, I saw the icon. Yeah, it's, you know, <laughs> that's for sure. And Robert is on our hearing committee. We have an acupuncturist representing. Think one more. Thanks, Lori. That was uh, that was a great umbrella. Uh, yeah, kept me dry throughout the. Um, I have, a, I guess, a couple of comments and then a question. Um, one comment, I think I'm just uh, dovetailing on Robert's uh, comment about technology and um, my concern with all these kind of cool apps and whatnot is that patients are going to think that they're a doctor and be self-diagnosing uh, and self-treating. And so I think that there's a place, you know, for you know, a blood pressure or, you know, those kind of things. But when it gets to where devices, um, I, I just, I, I think we're, that's a dangerous um, path in some ways. I think, um, and getting back to your uh, your history with, uh, with Alina, I was wondering if you could comment just on um, segueing on the, our acupuncturist's concern about how do we actually, um, how do we shift the, the Titanic 
Um, I mean, we, you know, there's an, enough evidence now and enough, you know, um, uh, research on a lot of these uh, integrative uh, approaches, um, but yet um, there still seems to be um, difficulty getting, you know, kind of, uh, you know, may maybe it's education, I don't know, but I'm wondering, like at Alina, I'm sure when the program with, uh, uh, with Dusik and those uh, working at the hospital, there must have been a point where this was a new thing, right? And you had to somehow get in there, and then it seemed to me, just from the history, that you know maybe you had to prove yourselves. I'm just, course, yeah. I'm just wondering how did that, how did that, kind of you know get to where you had thousands of patients that have had integrative therapies, and and how did it, how did that happen? You know. Um, well, let's see. What time is it? Um, I mean, that, that's ten years of work. You know, it's building relationships. It's definitely from day one building your data repository. Um, I mean, you absolutely have to collect data about everything. I think we probably had like 3,000 data points that we collected. Some of it became not meaningful, but the, the point was you have to collect not only care data, but operational data and financial data. And you have to create this package that you are constantly selling every single year. And I think sometimes we think about what service do I implement? How do I operationalize a service? And we forget about sustainability. We just want to get that service in place and we get sort of narrow-minded. But without data collection, you really can't tell a story and you can't, you can't move the dial. So that, to me, that's absolutely fundamental. If you were going to have a, you know, your ideal primary care clinic or, or even your ideal inpatient uh, service. What would what would that look like? Can't give that away because that's what I'm in the midst of trying to create at Meridian. I see. Yeah. I see. It would be fully right. integrated, All and right. and we wouldn't even be using those words, and it would be driven by the patient, and there would be the partnership of the provider, no matter if it was a physician or an acupuncturist, that it wouldn't be. Um, there'd be a balance of power, and there'd be a balance of knowledge. Um, I just think it has to be a partnership, and. And we just we would recognize through evidence and through relationship that all of these kinds of therapies blended together the science of medicine, the science of alternative medicine, um, that we can appreciate and respect all of that because every individual is so individualized. They it's not cookie cutter, and that's true if somebody's going in to see an acupuncturist. I don't want a cookie cutter acupuncture appointment. I want a holistic approach to who I am as an individual. So ideally, it's all integrated everywhere across the continuum and into the community and from birth to death. How's that? Yeah, I think it, it gets back. it's all back, paid for it's, and. <laughs> it gets back to the art of health care mm -hmm. instead of it just being a technology. It's absolutely an art. And implementing and operationalizing something like this is an absolute art. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. There's light refreshments outside. Everyone's welcome to stick around.